Welcome to Lecture 1 for Radiochemistry. This is Chemistry 312. The readings are the chart of the nuclides, which you should have received, table of the isotopes, which is downloadable, and Chapter 1 from Modern Nuclear Chemistry, which can be found at this URL. This first lecture is divided into two parts, each part being around half an hour. Throughout this course, I'll try to keep the lectures to half an hour or less. The first part goes up to talk about the history of radiochemistry, nuclear physics, and the discovery of the actinides. And the second part will be focusing on terms involved in radiochemistry. This lecture overall will cover class and organization, talk about the outcomes and grading, the history of radio, uh, radi radionuclide and radiation research, which will pretty much end with the first lecture going up to discovery of the actinides. And then the second lecture will explore the chart of the nuclides and the table of the isotopes, the description and use of these tables and the data that are included. And then there will be an introduction to radiochemistry, including atomic properties, nomenclature, a discussion of x-rays, and then types of radioactive decay. We'll end this lecture with a discussion on nuclear forces, and that's fundamentally the limitations of the topics within the course. Okay, the purpose of this course is listed here. It's really des uh, designed to increase the uh, potential pool of researchers for issues related to radiochemistry, and particularly the nuclear fuel cycle. As we'll discuss in the course, nuclear fuel cycle includes nuclear fuel separations and other terms listed here. Um, the course will emphasize the role radiochemistry plays in the nuclear fuel cycle. And uh, for students who are interested in pursuing this research further, uh, completion of this course, you'll be invited to participate in research that's ongoing in the UNLV radiochemistry program. We've successfully um, had a number of students who have uh, performed research in our program and have gone on to uh, obtain doctorates, doctorates in our program and other PhD programs around the country. The course covers a number of topics. Fundamentally, radiochemistry is the intellectual intersection of the periodic table and the chart of the nuclides. There's, within this course, we'll emphasize the chemistry of radio elements. Examples are technetium and the actinides. Within this course, we're going to go over a few topics, including understanding the chart of the nuclides, which we'll get to today details on alpha, beta, gamma decay and fission, methods for investigating nuclear properties, then some fundamental chemistry of the radio uh, that's involved in radiochemistry. We'll also discuss isotope production and finally radiochemistry and research and technology. The textbooks that we'll use uh, will be supplemented by published literature and these are, will be available as PDFs usually linked to the web page. So for this course and for this lecture, you can go to the web page of the course and find some of the links of some of the information we'll talk about today. The student input is instrumental to this course. Uh, we expect participation in course and during the class meetings, and also assistant on the course development, which really means this web page. Uh, some of the output that you provide should enhance uh, the online aspects of the course. The outcomes of the course are listed here. As we develop the course and get into more details, these topics will be discussed in much more detail. So the first outcome is listed here, and this is uh, really a discussion on how to use the chart of the nuclides and the table of the isotopes um, and how it applies to radiochemistry and nuclear technology. Fundamentally, by the end of the course, you should be able to operate the chart of the nuclides, so bring it to class when we have our meetings is essential. There's also a part of the course which will discuss nuclear structure. I'm sure most of you would think right now the nucleus is nothing more than a dot, but here there's pictures of nuclei. Here's your spherical nucleus. Then there's an oblate and a prolate nucleus. We'll find out that nuclei have shapes and that shapes, that nuclear shape has influence on some of the properties of the nucleus. We'll also explore the chemistry of the radio elements. We'll really focus on the chemistry of the actinides. That has to do with the 5F electrons. If we look at the periodic table, the actinides are the bottom row, the lanthanides above them 
fill the 4F electrons, and the actinides fill the 5F electrons. We'll also explore and evaluate nuclear reactions in the production of isotopes. How we can use data, for instance, cross-section data, which we'll introduce and describe in a little bit more detail later in the course. Reaction particles, how reactions with neutrons, alpha particles, ions, or even photons can uh, force nuclear reactions. Then we'll also talk about energetics of reactions, which is basically mass differences. We're going to utilize E equals mc squared to help explain this. So as this figure demonstrates, here's a nuclear reaction. Nitrogen 15 and a proton can make oxygen 16. Alpha particle, this is enough energy, an alpha particle can escape. It'll make an excited carbon-12 nucleus. This decays with a photon to make a ground state carbon-12. Then we'll go over reactions like this throughout the course. We'll also discuss and describe radioactive decay. And we'll discuss this uh, with some expectations of radioactive decay based on where they are in the chart of the nuclides. So low Z isotopes, how do they behave differently than high Z isotopes, Z being the proton number, and how does the decay mode uh, vary with half-life. The final two outcomes are coupled, where we'll explore uh, radiochemistry and research, and modern topics related to radiochemistry and the nuclear fuel cycle. The information for grades for Chem 312 are shown here. The PDF quizzes that are at the end of the lecture are 15% of the grade. These are based upon the information that's presented in the lecture and they should be returned by email. The uh, lecture zero was an example of how those uh, quizzes should be submitted. There were 15%, there's 19 PDF quizzes. PDF quiz zero is an extra credit. So each quiz is worth about 0 0.8 points. You can complete the quiz up until the day it's due if you send it in earlier and I respond to it. And if there are errors, you can resubmit your quiz. And as long as it's submitted by the due date, you can submit it as many times as uh, there are responses. and You'll get full grading for the PDF quiz. There are also four comprehensive quizzes. Each one is worth 15 percent of the total grade. So these are based upon topics covered in lectures in the PDF quizzes and examples that are provided at the end of the lectures. It's a take-home quiz and the due dates are provided on the quiz. There's fundamentally two due dates. The first due dates, I mean, you have to submit both of them. The first due date is five days after the quiz is uh, posted. Um, at the end of this, at, when this is complete, the answers to the quiz will be posted. You'll have three more days to respond with a second uh, iteration of the quiz if you want to change answers. On the second iteration, any changed answers must be accompanied by reasons why these answers were changed. And you'll get 50% of the grade on any changed answer. The goal of the quiz is to demonstrate material comprehension. So one of the that's one of the reasons we have these iterations, so that any missed topics are repeated and hopefully learned. The final is worth 15% of the grade. And the, the final is a combination of some topics related to radiochemistry. There might be a presentation, for example, a TED Talk that's related to radiochemistry. You'll be asked to view the presentation, make some comments on it. You can also review positions. Uh, the employment positions that are related to radiochemistry. There will be also examples of uh, papers that you can read and comment on. The role of the final is to uh, show a synopsis of the material covered in class and applications into topics that were also discussed in the class. Class participation is worth 10% of the grades and this includes any blogs or office hours or Skype meetings that we have so at the end of each lecture, you'll be asked to respond to the blog. You should comment on the blog, even if the comment is nothing more than completed the lecture, submitted the PDF quiz. That's worth 10% of the grade. There's also blogs for quizzes. Again, if you have really nothing else but just submitted the quiz, you can, blog, you can write on the blog that the quiz has been submitted. The grades for Chemistry 312 will be posted on 
the UNLV web campus. This way that you can individually look up your grades for each of the PDF quizzes and the uh, comprehensive quizzes, the final, and the class participations. The quizzes themselves will not be on web campus. They will be on the course website. The agenda for the course is provided here. Again, the agenda is on the web page, redchem.nevada.edu, classes chemistry 312. And the topics are shown here along with the dates of the tests. See, the first test is in February, second test, March, third test, end of March, the fourth and final test, end of April. The final test will be completed before the end of uh, the coursework. The final will be posted at the uh, first day of finals, and it'll be due the last day of finals, Saturday, the 13th of May. So again, this is a uh, final which will be submitted as the other PDF quizzes. All right, let's begin the information of the course by discussing the history of radiation research. It really started about 120 years ago with the discovery of radioactivity. Uh, this was an experiment performed by Becquerel and the Curies. The Curies are shown here later from this 1896 date. That's Pierre and Marie Curie in their laboratory in Paris. Becquerel used a uh, potassium uranyl sulfate salt. He exposed it to sunlight, then wrapped it in photographic plates that were within black paper. So no light can penetrate uh, the paper, so the photographic plates would only see light or photons they were emanating from the uranyl salts. The plates were developed and they showed an image of the uranyl crystals when they were developed. Now Becquerel assumed what had happened is that the crystals absorbed the sunlight and then phosphoresced, releasing photons that resulted in the images on the plates. What actually occurred, as we know, is that the uranium is radioactive, the daughters are also radioactive. They decay. When they decay from an excited nuclear state to a de-excited nuclear state, they emit a photon. And this photon is what was um, interacting with the photographic plates to result in the uranyl crystals. Obviously, this is an uh, early form of x-rays, which Marie Curie did utilize, particularly during the First World War in France. Uh, she helped set up uh, trucks that were at the front performing x-rays on wounded soldiers. And then a couple years after this discovery of radioactivity, um, in 1898, uh, the Curies isolated radium and polonium from uranium ore. So these are the daughters of uranium. Uranium is radioactive and it decays down to lead and some of the decay products include radium and polonium isotopes. And right at the turn of the century in 1899, radiation was described into alpha, beta, and gamma components. And this is based upon the penetration of obje objects and their ability to cause ionization. Alpha particle is the uh, one that can be stopped with the lowest amount of material, winds up being the highest mass. It can be stopped with a piece of paper. Beta particle, which we now identify as an electron, can be stopped with aluminum foil, piece of plastic. Gamma particles, those are photons, those are very difficult to stop. We use lead shielding. Um, and now in 1903, the Curies and Becquerel were awarded the Nobel Prize for the discovery of radioactivity. And then in uh, 1909, Ernest Rutherford in his lab showed that the alpha particle was indeed a helium nucleus, so we identified the alpha particle is the helium nucleus, and he showed it to have a charge, a charge of two, where it could be deflected by a magnetic field. So he showed that the particle was relatively massive. Further, a couple years later, 1911, uh, Rutherford extended upon Thomson's plum pudding model, where the plum pudding model basically said that the atom composed of was composed of both positive and negative charges, with the negative charges scattered in as in uh, a 
plum pudding, raisins in a plum pudding. Uh, Rutherford demonstrated in 1911 that uh, the nucleus actually was a high central charge that had a relatively small volume. And he did this with his famous uh, gold foil experiments where we took an alpha emitting isotope and watched the scattering of the alpha particles on the gold foil. Most of the particles would go through. If the Thompson model was correct, all the particles would go through. But a small number of particles scattered off the gold foil and Rutherford was extremely surprised by this. He, uh, he related it to a cannonball being, re being scattered by a piece of paper. And from this, he hypothesized that the nucleus contained the positive charge, a small, high central charge, small volume in the atom. In 1912, the cloud chamber was developed by Wilson. The cloud chamber, you can think of the first real detector in which particles ionized vapor, and this vapor formed clouds in a small uh, chamber, which could be used to detect radiation. Cloud chambers can still be used today. Uh, they're not used as much, but they're excellent demonstration tools. Then in 1913, Bohr expanded upon the Rutherford model and developed what we now know as the planetary model. And this basically took the central nucleus and then put the electrons into defined orbits. In 1914, Henry Mosley, working in Rutherford's laboratory, showed that the nuclear charge can be determined from x-rays. This is a technique that we still use today, and it was an important discovery of its time. Unfortunately, uh, Mosley, in 1915, was killed at the Battle of Gallipoli in the First World War. He, Rutherford actually lobbied to prevent his in, uh, joining the service. And after his death, the English government uh, forbid any prominent scientist from joining the war effort. His loss was a huge blow to the research community. That it was speculated that he would have won the Nobel Prize in 1916 had he not been killed. And he was 27 years old when he died. So there was a delay in discoveries because of the First World War. Then by 1919, artificial transmutation by nuclear reactions were observed, and again, this was in Rutherford's lab. And uh, nitrogen-14 was bombarded with an alpha particle to make oxygen-17. This is, this is what actually occurs in air. If you think about um, air, most of the isotope in air would be nitrogen, since the bulk of air is nitrogen, and nitrogen-14 being the common isotope. And then the discoveries kept moving forward in 1919. The mass spectrometer was in initially discovered and uh, utilized. And then uh, about a decade later, 1928, understanding the, all the work that was observed was uh, put forward through um, trying to develop concepts and models to describe radioactivity. One of the important concepts was by Gamow, where he described alpha decay through tunneling experiments. We'll talk about this when we discuss alpha decay, where Fundamentally, the alpha particle tunnels through a barrier, and the height of the barrier, the higher the energy, is, uh, as the barrier is higher, it narrows, so the probability of tunneling increases. And when we talk about alpha decay, we'll see that uh, a shorter half-life is associated with a higher energy. In 1930, Enrico Fermi came up with the neutrino hypothesis, which is central to understanding beta decay. Again, we'll discuss this within beta decay. And for the neutrino hypothesis, uh, there's a particle, the neutrino, which does not have mass, has a spin of one half. This is utilized to help explain beta decay. And then in 1932, at University of California, Berkeley, Ernest Lawrence invents the first cyclotron. Here's a picture of the first cyclotron, and it's about the size of something that could fit in one's hand. Discoveries continued in nuclear science. In 1932, James Chadwick used scattering data to calculate the mass of the neutron. Rutherford knew that A was about twice Z. This led to a proton nuclear model in the nucleus, and at the time, 
Chadwick was working at the Cavendish Laboratories in Cambridge with Rutherford. Chadwick would uh, move from those labs in 1935. And, and then in 1934, artificial, discover, artificial radioactivity was discovered. Uh, Frederick Joliet and Irene Curie, the daughter of Marie and Pierre Curie, showed that alphas on aluminum formed phosphorus. They evaluated this reaction. This was an evaluation showing that you could art produce artificial radioactive isotopes. This led to the Nobel Prize. Uh, so Irene Curie, the daughter of two Nobel laureates, also won a Nobel Prize. Further on, 1938, there was the discovery of nuclear fission. So reactions of slow neutrons with uranium produced fission products and energy. Uh, Otto Hahn and Lisa Meitner were the drivers of this work. They were awarded the Nobel Prize in 1944. Otto Hahn uh, and Lisa Meitner did this work yeah, with, with Fritz Strassmann in Germany. Um, and this was actually an important consideration for the Manhattan Project, where in the United States there was, an under, there was a belief that the Germans were fairly far ahead in the development of uh, applications of fission for military purposes. However, at this time, Lisa Meitner uh, had to flee Germany because of her, uh, the fact that she was Jewish. So this was, uh, this, this, she was actually one of many scientists that left Europe, such as Einstein and Enrico Fermi, for the United States uh, during the 30s. And, they, and these scientists also worked on the U.S.-led uh, Manhattan Project and nuclear research in general. In 1942, December 2nd, uh, was the first controlled uh, fission reactor at the University of Chicago, CP1. This reactor is graphite moderated. Here's a picture. You can see that there's graphite. There's graduate students at the top that would be used in, uh, <laughs> that would cut control rods that would go down to the reactor in case the uh, reactor uh, reactions were uncontrolled. Uh, this was developed and guided by Enrico Fermi, and this is one of the, actually prior to 1942, Enrico Fermi was also awarded the Nobel Prize for uh, evaluation of fission. Then the culmination of the Manhattan Project, 1945, uh, from work that was done in a number of locations in the United States. The first uh, fission device was tested in Alamogordo, New Mexico in July 1945. Uh, one of the uh, efforts associated with this was the discovery of plutonium, which occurred uh, earlier, and when we'll discuss this when we discuss plutonium. Glenn Seaborg was, the res was uh, awarded the Nobel Prize for the discovery of plutonium in this work that was in 1941. And then a uh, culmination of some of our early work in nuclear uh, research is in 1947, where the development of radiocarbon dating by Libby, um, and again, Libby was awarded the Nobel Prize for this in 1960. So if you evaluate this work, you can see that a host of Nobel laureates derived uh, the research for their projects based upon early nuclear research. The Curies, Becquerel, Rutherford, Chadwick, uh, Lawrence with the accelerator, and we'll also see that the first accelerator was useful in the discovery of other elements, particularly um, one that was of interest where directly linked Lawrence's work is the discovery of technetium. Uh, and then other Nobel laureates from this work include Glenn Seaborg and uh, Libby for his work with carbon-14 dating. One of the consequences of all this nuclear research that was ongoing was the uh, impact on the periodic table. Today, here's an example of the periodic table. We see that we have up to 118 elements. And these include uh, two of the most recently named elements, Plerovium and Livermorium. So prior to the, uh, all this research on nuclear uh, reactions, the periodic table really didn't have the uh, actinides, Glenn Seaborg developed the actinide hypothesis and placed them below the lanthanides. And we also were missing a number of elements uh, beyond uranium. 
One of the things that's germane to radiochemistry is, are the radio elements, and we see that there's two radio elements uh, that are below bismuth, promethium here at Z of 61, and technetium here at 43. There's other radio elements, um, the elements polonium, actinium, radon listed here, the actinides here, and then some of the, uh, just from francium on, and then the transactinide elements all the way up to element 118 where we currently stand today. And we'll discuss the radio elements now, at least some of them, and we'll start with the lightest radio element, technetium, which was discovered in 1936 at the University of Palermo in Sicily. This work was done by Carlo Pierre and Emilio Segre, and it was, it was actually a collaboration that involved a piece of molybdenum that was used as a uh, deflector in a cyclotron from Ernest Lawrence. So this molybdenum was bombarded with many particles. If you look where molybdenum is on the periodic table, it's a Z of 42 going any sort of nuclear reaction that increases that Z, so uh, where a proton is added, will make 43. Technetium has different chemistry, and Segre isolated a few isotopes of technetium, and he named it uh, after the Greek word uh, for artificial, although some of the University of Palermo officials wanted the name to reflect the university. Later, Segre and Glenn Seaborg work together to isolate technetium 99M, and this isotope is currently the workhorse for radiopharmaceutical applications. Promethium, uh, which is another uh, radio element that is lighter than bismuth, was first produced in 1945 at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and it was from fission products of uranium fuel in the graphite reactor. The discovery was announced two years later due to secrecy concerns, and then in the early 60s, through ion exchange method, Oak Ridge prepared about 10 grams of promethium from used nuclear fuel. For an, isot for an isotope with such a short half-life, that's a lot of activity in that material. So if we look at the, some of the radio elements, we'll start with the discussion of materials that are beyond uranium, so these are called the transuranic elements. Uh, uranium is a natural radioactive isotope. Neptunium was one of the first synthesized transuranic elements, and this was done at the University of California, Berkeley, by Macmillan in 1940. And what they did, they bombarded uranium with cyclotron-produced neutrons. So the uranium-238, listed here, captured a neutron, was in an excited state, emitted a photon, and this made uranium-239. By beta decay, that extra neutron was uh, changed into a proton, so that made neptunium-239. This neptunium-239 has a very relatively short half-life of 2.4 days. So the specific activity, the amount of activity from a handful of uh, atoms is sufficient to identify. The chemical properties weren't clear at the time of the discovery. In fact, the actinides were not currently, were not in their current location on the periodic table. They were actually in the same group as tungsten. Um, this was the first evidence of the 5F shell, and then later macroscopic amounts of neptunium-237 were made by a uh, fast neutron reaction on uranium-238, where one neutron would come in, two neutrons would come out. That would create uranium-237, and that would debate a decay up to neptunium-237. The second transuranic element to be produced um, and identified was plutonium. And actually, Macmillan, when he made Neptunium-239 also produced plutonium-239. Uh, uranium-239 beta decayed to neptunium-239, which had a 2.4-day half-life. Macmillan identified that as a separate element. However, when the neptunium decayed to plutonium-239, the half-life was over 24,000 years. The specific activity was too low. He was unable, with this relatively small amount of activity of, of atoms that he produced, he was not able to see that activity. Uh, but what was the isotope that was used for identifying plutonium was plutonium-238. And this was produ produced in 1940, where again they used the um, cyclotron at UC Berkeley, where they bombarded uranium-238 with deuterium. Two neutrons came out that produced neptunium-238. This neptunium-238 beta decays to plutonium-238. There's a half-life of about 80 years, which has a high enough specific activity to observe. 
they were able to oxidize the Neptu this plutonium-238 and showed that it behaved that it was chemically different than the uranium. So they identified that as a new element. Then later in 1941, they produced plutonium-239, where they used uranyl nitrate. They put that into a paraffin or a wax box behind a beryllium target, bombarded with deuterium. This made a lot of fast neutrons. The paraffin block would slow down those neutrons. The uranium that was sitting in that wax captured the neutrons, so it went from uranium-238 to uranium-239, that beta decayed to neptunium-239, that beta decayed to plutonium-239. They separated the plutonium from the uranium uh, by using fluorides, and they extracted into diethyl ether. And then they took that material, and they eventually showed that the plutonium-239 underwent fission with thermal or slow energy neutrons. It's a very important property. It's one of the nuclear properties that drives the... So if we move beyond plutonium, we go to americium and curium. Now these were first produced in nuclear reactors that were used during the Manhattan Project from successive capture onto plutonium-239. So this route is shown here. So if I have plutonium-239 and I add a neutron, I get plutonium-240. If I add another neutron to that, I get plutonium-241. The plutonium-241 has a half-life of around 14 years, and that beta decays to americium-241. So they were producing the americium in reactors. And then if I eventually, I can eventually capture up americium-241 to americium-242, that would beta decay to curium-242. However, the identification for direct production was done by nuclear reactions uh, that are listed here. In fact, a number of nuclear reactions were used. But as an example, uranium-238 plus helium produced, um, uh, produced plutonium-241. That beta decayed into americium-241. They also did um, direct production using uh, plutonium as a target and even neptunium as a target. There was also direct production of curium-242 by using plutonium-239 as a target, hitting it with a uh, helium nucleus. A neutron would come out along with the curium-242. They were able to chemically separate this curium-242 from the plutonium target, and the curium-242 decays by alpha and that makes this plutonium-238. They, they knew what plutonium-238, the uh, what the alpha energy from that was from previous experiments. So when they saw an alpha energy with a half-life similar to plutonium-238, they knew that that had to come from curium-242. There were lots of difficulties in separating curium uh, from americium and from the trivalent lanthanides, so much so that there were the, this caused a lot of consternation in the original researchers. It's actually a pretty fruitful area of research today, separating the uh, americium from curium, and then americium and curium from the trivalent lanthanides. There's publications on the webpage, the original publications that announced the discoveries of americium and curium, and you can view those. Berkelium and Californium, uh, there's a trend now where in order to make some of these heavier elements, what one would do is isolate some of the newer elements, use those as targets. So these had to be these new, relatively new elements. So in the case of Berkelium and Californium, they needed targets of americium and curium. They need to be produced in sufficient quantities, so milligram quantities. And if you took the americium and bombarded that with helium, or the curium and bombarded that with helium, you would get either a 2N reaction to make Berkelium-243, or a one end reaction to make the californium 245. And these are listed here. These, um, since they're trivalents, they were separated by ion exchange. The berkelium was done with uh, cation exchange, and the californium was done with anion exchange. And if I look at the chart here, here's the resin where the metal ions are eluted. Here's the log of the activity. Here's the drops of the eluent going through the column. And we see a trend here, curium, berkelium, californium. So if we were to make elements beyond californium, where would they elute? So there's where the berkelium and the californium would elute. And the question is, where would you expect to find elements beyond californium? That's right, you'd expect to find those earlier in earlier elution droplets. 
What we do know about the actinides is that there's something called the actinide contraction. As I go heavier in the actinide elements with the same oxidation state, the ionic radii decrease. So this is nothing more than a trend evaluating a decrease in ionic radii. So the smaller the ionic radii, the earlier the elution. Einsteinium and fermium, they were actually produced in a different route from one of the um, first uh, thermonuclear tests. You can, uh, you, there's a YouTube link that's here, so you can actually view information on that first thermonuclear test, including how the device worked. And within there, they talk about uh, the production of all sorts of elements through excessive neutron reactions. So not only were Einsteinium and Fermium produced, but new isotopes of plutonium. And the, um, the, the reason that this, this occurred is that there was a large neutron flux, so you got heavy uranium isotopes followed by beta decay. So if you had uranium-238 in there, for instance, you might be able to capture five, six, seven neutrons before you would have decay. And then you would have successive uh, conversion of those neutrons into protons moving up the periodic table. This is similar, and we'll talk about this, in nucleosynthesis, what happens in stars to make these elements called the R process. Ion exchange was used to separate these elements. And again, as we go heavier in the actinides, we get faster elution. There's also something interesting about this. This curve here that I'm showing is actually something that you could use to figure out the yield of the device or how many neutrons were produced in that device. The last three actinides to be produced, Mendelavium, Nobelium, and Lorentzium, uh, their chemistry or their production routes change a little bit because now we're doing atom at a time chemistry. So for these elements, you would make one atom at a time in a nuclear reaction. So if, for instance, for Mendelavium, an Einsteinium target would be bombarded with helium. A neutron would come out along with the product uh, Mendelavium 256. This required a high degree of chemical separation. If I only have one atom in solution, I need to separate that. Often catcher foils were used. From this nuclear reaction, I have a high energy helium hitting the Einsteinium. The compound nucleus that is made has enough energy to recoil out of the target and we get caught by a catcher foil. Often this catcher foil is very thin gold. The gold would be dissolved up and then ion exchange chemistry would be used to separate out the product. Now, there was a controversy with Nobelium. It was expected to be like the other actinides, trivalent chemistry. But nobelium is actually divalent. It has a filled 5F, so it's got 14 5F electrons. Very difficult to remove one of those 5F electrons. You can remove the 7S electrons, so it's plus 2. But getting into the plus 3 state proved to be very difficult. <clears throat> and the data was hard to reproduce. In fact, Glenn Seaborg had told me that for a while they called it nobelium. Lorentium was produced by bombarding curium with boron, and there was a new isotope that was identified with a 8.6 MeV, six second half life, and this was identified as uh, the Lorentium 258. This completes the first part of lecture one. You're not required to comment on the blog or respond to the PDF quiz yet. Please do so after completing all of the lecture.